All right, let's continue our discussion. Okay. So in the first half, I explained to you how we calculate GDP through different approach. And we have looked at some examples. Now this is another example. Okay, look at this flow, uh, flow chart diagram. Okay, so if we want, let's start with simple one. Okay, so if we want to use spending approach, and then we need to identify the following things. We need to identify C, I, G and X, right? So this is spending approach. So C, C is going to capture the buy here, 700, okay? G, let's look at something simpler, okay? G, so this is gonna capture by here. Government purchase goods and service. That's gonna be 200. And the next I, so what's I? I is going to be captured by here. 120. Right? And lastly, net export. So that's going to be equal to, or captured by export minus import. 30 minus 50. That gives you negative 20. All right? So if we add all together, so the GDP will be 1,000. So this is spending approach, right? And then alternatively, what we can do, we can look at, uh, we can look at value added approach, okay? So there's a value added, so very simple in this model, right? Because there's no intermediate goods, yeah? And then so you can look at what a firm produced. But what a firm produced is going to, is going to reflect by here, 1,000. So this is, a, this is a value added. The second, second way. Thirdly, we can look at income, right? So, but this also becomes obvious because income goes to here, right? So everything here. Wage income, profit, interest, rent, they equal to 1,000. Okay, so now here, as you can see, there are three different approach so that we can calculate the GDP. Okay, so a few things I want to emphasize. Look at here. We have net export of negative 20. And how we make up this shortfall of $20? Actually, it comes from here. Foreign borrows, foreign borrowing and sales of stock. Foreign lendings and purchase of stocks. So here, this part essentially means foreigners lend to us. And here it means foreigners borrow from us. So they lend more than we borrow. And this difference exactly equal to 20, but this 20 is exactly used to cover this $20 of shortfall. All right. Okay, so this is this example. Now we have another example. Okay. So similarly, so we can use three different approach. Okay. Now here, so I'm going to only use, uh, I'm going to only explain to you income approach. The right. income approach. So we need to identify income. So you have profit income. Wage income, rental income. Okay. Now, one thing you want to be very careful is sales tax. Sales tax is not an income. Right? Sales tax, so some students may say, oh, so sales tax is income for government. But if you consider that as income of government, and then so you must subtract 
the sales tax from either the profit or wage or rent, whoever pay for the tax. Otherwise, you're gonna have double counting. So that's the only thing that I want to emphasize. Okay, so you're gonna see a similar, similar problem in your homework assignment. Let's look at one more practice question. Suppose country A sells 100 million worth of goods and services to country B. Country B sells 50 million to A. These are only two countries in macroeconomy. Net export in country, now we can look at A, B. A sell 100 to B and B sell 50 to A. Now if we look at A, so the net export of A is gonna be 100 minus 50. If we look at B, the net export is going to be 50 minus 100. Right? And then, so you can see A is correct. Okay. Another practical question Income spent on imported goods, A, represent income that has leaked across national border. It is true. B must be subtracted from spending data to calculate accurate value of domestic production. That's correct. C is income that is not spent on domestically produced goods and services. It's also correct. Hence, D, A, B, C are all correct. Right. Okay. Let's so now we switch to another topic as another important topic in this chapter we are going to differentiate between our real gdp and a nominal gdp all right so what is real gdp real gdp is the total value of final goods and services produced in the economy during a given year calculated using the price of a selected base year so the key word is base year and then what is nominal GDP? Similarly, we calculate the GDP, but we use the price of the current year. Right? So the keyword is current year. You may wonder so why that matters. It's because so when we calculate GDP is a summation of goods and service. Right? But different goods and a different service, they have different price. Right? In some sense, you cannot simply add apple versus pear. Right? So if you produce three apples, say three apple, five pears, versus five apple, three pears, how we are going to compare these two economies? Okay, so you cannot calculate, you cannot simply count the number because if you add a number, you give you, both give you eight, but that doesn't mean these two economies produce the same amount of GDP. Hence, we need to put a market value for apple and pear. So that's why we need to look at the price. But the price change from one year to the other year. Okay, and then, so this price matters a lot when we calculate the GDP. So that's why we have real GDP and nominal GDP. Now maybe we can look at examples to understand how we calculate real GDP versus nominal GDP. In this example, there's an economy, they only produce two types of goods. One is apple, the other is oranges. Okay. There are two years we can, we, we, uh, we can compare, year one versus year two. In year one, we have 2,000 apple and 1,000 orange. And in year two, we have 2,200. When we have uh, apple, then we have 1,200 orange. So this is year one, year two. That is the quantity we produced. 
all right? So if you only compare the number, what you can say, you, fortunately, so we can say, oh, so year two, so you produce more in both terms. So that gives you a sense of oh, there's economic growth. But then so we need to understand to what extent the economy grow, right? So this largely depending on how we are going to calculate the market value of our GDP. Okay, so let's start with nominal GDP. Nominal GDP, let's just put on the top, nominal GDP. Year one and year two. Nominal GDP, we just use the quantity times the price, quantity times the price, okay? And then in year one, the nominal GDP is gonna be 2,000 times 25 plus 1,000 times 50 cents, <coughs> right? Similarly, Year two, 22,000 times 30 cents plus 1,200 times 70 cents. Okay, so this nominal GDP, nominal GDP, All right? So now in the bottom, I'm gonna to explain to you how we calculate real GDP. But real GDP depending on which year we use as base year. Now, if we use year one as base year, what that means, means so whenever we calculate year one or year two, we always use year one's price. We just fix the price. The reason why we want to fix the price is we do not want inflate what we produced. Okay, now I can calculate it. Year one, year two. Year one, the real GDP by construction equal to, equal to nominal GDP because we use year one as base year. Let me just repeat what we just did, right? 2,000 is the quantity times the price of base year because we use year one as base year, so that must be 25 cents plus 1,000 times 50 cents. Now we go to year two. Quantity is 2,200, 1,200. Right price, now we use the same price. So now here, so we compare rear versus nominal. We compare rear versus nominal. Okay, so if you, if you look at year two, you can clearly see, so year two, the calculation is different because in real GDP, we use the price of, of, uh, of the base year. In nominal GDP, we use the price of the current year. All right. Okay, so here just explain to you how we calculate rear versus nominal GDP. Okay. Now we, let's look at some examples to understand how we calculate rear versus nominal. Okay. In this economy, they produce two things, tractors and pizza. Those are the quantities. And those are price. Nominal GDP in 2011. Okay? And then, so what we're gonna do is, we use quantity times the price, quantity times the price. So five times plus 80 times 50. All right? 
But then, so this question asks you to compare nominal GDP in 2011 compared with nominal GDP in 2010 and 2012. And then you must calculate the nominal GDP in 2010 and 2012 as well. So how are we going to do that? So five times 10,000, 100 times 10. And here, so five times 15,000 and 100 times 20. Once you calculate nominal GDP in all these three years, then so we are ready to compare nominal GDP. I leave the calculation for you as a practice. Okay. So the same table we just saw, but now here we want to find out the real GDP. And the base year we use is 2010, meaning whenever you calculate year 20 or year 20, uh, year 11 or 2011 or 2012, we always use the price here. Give you examples. Let me just calculate two years. If we look at real GDP of 2010, real GDP 2010 equal to five times plus, so this is 2010. Now, if you want to calculate real GDP in 2012, that's gonna be five times plus, 100 times 10, right? Because you will use this five multiplied by the price here. We use 100 multiplied by the price here. Okay, just remind you, so when you calculate year 2012's nominal GDP, we use five multiplied the price here. We use 100 multiplied the price here. All right, this is the same example, but ask you calculate real GDP. Okay, I leave the actual calculation for you as a practice. Okay, now so this part is almost identical as previous one. So instead you use 2010 as base year, now we use 2011 as base year. Meaning, so say for example, when we calculate 2012 real GDP, we use five, multiply the price in 2011. 100 multiply the price in 2011. All right? So I'll leave the calculation for you. Okay. Okay, so let me show you the actual data. So this is for US economy. We look at nominal GDP versus real GDP. Okay. And so this column gives you the nominal GDP in three selected year. And this column gives you real GDP in the same three years. So you can see throughout time, so the nominal GDP usually not equal to real GDP, except in this year, they are the same. And why they are the same is because we use 2009, we use 2009 as the base year. Okay, by construction, in the base year, real GDP equal to nominal GDP, right? So this is a real world example. Okay. So this just summarize what we have learned. Okay. Let's just go one by one. Except in best year, real GDP is not the same as nominal GDP. Okay. In best year, they are the same. 
Now, in reality, so we also introduced chain dollar. This is used to dealing with the case when we use different year as base year. You're going to calculate, let me write down, so different year as base year. It's going to give you different value of real GDP. That's going to give you different measure of real GDP growth. So that imposes a challenge for us. Okay. So we are going to end up with different growth rate. How should we report the number? This chain of dollar is exactly used to solve that problem. And what this chain of dollar says is, so feel free to calculate the real GDP, choose different year as base year. So typically, so for example, we have year T, and then we have year T plus one. We look at the growth between these two years. And what I just explained to you is, if you use T as base year, versus use T plus one as base year, you're gonna have different growth rate. And then this channel tells us, okay, so why not just calculate the growth, use T as base year, and then calculate the same growth, use T plus one as base year. And then so you just take the average of these two growth rate. So that's what we call chain dollar. Okay. The last concept in this slide is called GDP per capita. So essentially, we just divide the GDP by population, convert it into a per person term. Okay. It's better than aggregate GDP, but it's not a perfect measure. Just think about GDP doesn't tell you inequality. What is inequality? Just means it means or it measures the difference in income. Okay. This is reflected by the slides here. Okay. GDP is an important indicator to the health of the economy, but it's not perfect. Here's one way to look at that. Okay. So on the horizontal line, we have per capita GDP. Vertical line essentially measuring the happiness of the country. That is percentage of population reporting a thriving well-being, meaning people feel excited or feel happy. And overall, there's a trending up. Okay? But however, you have outliers. Okay? So you have a country uh, fairly low, have fairly low income, but the heaven is pretty high. Okay. On the other hand, so you have a country whose income is fairly high, but their happiness is fairly low. Okay. So United States, we are here. We are close to this trend. Right. Okay. Let's skip this. Now we move to the last topic in this chapter. So we want to look at price level. And this is aggregate price level. Okay, so we are going to explain, we learn how to measure an aggregate price level through price indexes. Okay. So what is aggregate price level? This is a measure of overall level of prices in the economy. Overall means so this is going to be used to measuring not one goods or service, but many different goods and service. Right? 
In order to do that, economists define a market basket so that we can calculate the cost or so that we can measure the overall price. What is market basket? It is a hypothetical set of a consumer purchase of goods and services. Right? What that means? It just means, so we create a set of goods that a typical consumer, typical consumer will purchase in our daily life. Right? It probably includes food and beverage, includes education, includes transportation, includes travel, including housing, so on and so forth. Right? And this market basket includes all of the things a typical household per, um, purchase or consume. And then, so we keep track of the price of this basket. So that gives us a measure of aggregate price level. Okay. Again, let's use examples to understand. Okay. So we started with the definition of our market basket. So in this example, we define a market basket with the following three items, 200 orange, 50 grapefruits and 100 lemon. Now we want to keep track the cost of this basket. By looking at the change in cost, we have a sense how price level change. Okay. We look at two time period. One is pre-frost, the other is post-frost. So you can see across board, the price of those fruits increase, largely because of the supply, right? So this is from our microeconomics. In macroeconomics, we are going to focus on the cost. Okay. All right, so how are we going to calculate the cost? Let's start with pre-frost. Okay. So we just look at how much does it cost to purchase this market basket. Now we use quantity times price, right? So the quantity times the price, quantity times the price, and the quantity times the price. So that's, that's just given by here, 200 times 20 cents, 50 times 60 cents, 100 times 25 cents. That gives you 95. Now we can do the similar exercise for post frost. Okay, so we use quantity times price, quantity times price, quantity times price. Okay, so that is represented by 200 times 40 cents, 50 times $1, 100 times 45 cents. That gives you 175. Okay. So comparing the cost, 95 versus 170, that gives you the sense how the price level change over time. This price level is not for a single good. This is for a bundle of goods. It is useful is because that's going to reflect the aggregate not individual, right? So now we have a definition of a price index, which is the cost of purchasing a given market basket in a given year, where that cost is normalized so that is equal to 100 in the selected base year, okay? Let's just go back to previous, slides that just means okay so when we cut when we calculate price index we select a base year if we pick pre-frost as base year 
And then so we set the price index in pre-frost as 100. Now we want to calculate the post-frost price index. And then so we use the cost of the basket in post-frost divided by the cost of the same basket in pre-frost times 100, give you price index. So in other words, so post frost, let's just write down post frost price index equal to 175 divided by 95 times 100. Where does this come, 100 coming from? Because we normalize the base year. So this base year, We normalize the base year as 100. Okay, so this is how we calculate price index. Right. And here is the formula. Right. So we can look at examples to understand this price index. So here's a table. In this table, there are three goods people consume. And then we have two years, and these are the price. Okay. And the first, we define the market basket. 200 orange, 100 apple, 100 banana. This is a market basket. Furthermore, 2011 is choose as base year. Now the question asks you, what is the value of price indexes in 2011? So the answer is immediate, 100. Why? Because we normalize the price index of base year as 100. Okay, let's go back to previous slide. So the cost of purchasing of market basket in a given year, where that cost is normalized so that it is equal to 100 in the selected base year. Okay, let's, let's pay attention to this sentence. It is equal to 100 in the selected base year. Or in other words, the price index in base year is equal to 100. So this question is obvious, 100. Now, the next question, the same table, but we will ask what is the price index in 2012? So let's rewrite those numbers, 200, 100, 100. Now how we are gonna proceed? So first we need to find out the cost of this basket in 2011 and then 2012. So let's find out cost in 2011, cost in 2012. Cost in 2011 equal to 200 times 50, 100 times quarter, 100 times 40. Cost in 2012, same quantity. Right? 
So once we find out the cause and the cause, and then so what are we gonna do? We use this number, divide by this number, and multiply by 100. Okay, so again, so I leave the actual calculation to you. Okay, so you should be able to find that number as long as you understand the formula. Right. Now, the last thing or the last concept, so we will discuss is inflation. That's about this belongs to price indexes. Okay? What is inflation? So inflation rate is a yearly percentage change in a price indexes. As you're gonna see, we are gonna look at different price index. Right? And typically, so we have consumer price index. And then, so we have inflation of consumer price index. But sometimes we look at other price index. As you're going to see in the following few slides, we may look at producer's price index. And similarly, you can calculate inflation rate based on producer's price index. But now, let's just finish the discussion by focusing on consumer price index. Okay. The consumer price index measures the cost of the market basket of typical American family consumer. And the inflation rate of a consumer price index equal to price index difference divided by the price index in base year times 100. Okay. So maybe we can use examples to understand. Look at here. So again, so we have the early example, right? So this is 200, 100, 100. And then, so here, this question asks you, what is the rate of inflation between 2011 and 2012, right? And again, so we use 2011 as base year. And then how we are gonna do? So look at the formula, right? So we, we need to find a price index in two years. And then, so essentially, we just find out the percentage change in price index, okay? And then, so we need to calculate the price index in both years. So because 2011 is used as base year, so the price index, of 2011 equal to 100. Price index 2012 equal to 103. That is coming from that is coming from the calculation we have done in the previous example. And then hence the inflation rate of inflation is 103 minus 100 divided by 100, right? So if you like multiply by 100, that is for normalization. So that's give you 3%. Okay. So we run out of time. So I'm gonna stop here for today and we are gonna see each other on Monday, okay? Thank you so much and have a great weekend.